Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We all want to grow in Christ. Or at least that should be every Christian's desire and concern. But growing in Christ must of necessity mean growing out of that which is not of Christ. Forward progress into truth can never occur while clinging on to backward error. And I think we could all agree that there's a lot of error floating around out there. And so this video will describe just a few of those errors that were fostered upon you as a new believer in Christ or perhaps fostered upon you as an older believer in Christ. In some of these er areas of, of non-truth, of myth, of legend, of fable, some of these areas of error might be a little difficult to dislodge from your mind, from your Christian experience, but but go they must. And let me be the first to add here that it must go only at God's prompting, not mine or anyone else's for that matter. So here are a few areas to I want you to seriously consider. And as usual, if you follow this channel, you know that I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. To consider allowing the Holy Spirit to convince you, not me or anyone else, but the Holy Spirit to convince you of the need for abandoning. Now, I think it, it should go without saying that very few believers would uh, embrace false teaching if they knew it to be false. The problem is that they don't initially understand that it's false. And there's one such, one of these uh, common errors of false teaching. It keeps the believer in constant fear of losing his eternal life. Now, this is the false teaching that's built upon the original true account gullible Christians are taught that they blaspheme against the Holy Ghost if they talk about any acts of tongues, healing, miracles, or, or even a message that is, that is said to be of God. And so by false use of these passages, they are held in bondage to any charlatan who proclaims to be of God. And if they don't agree or they speak against it, then they're told that they've blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I am quite sure, I'm quite well aware of the fact that there are many, m many of you are mature enough, you are educated enough, you are learned enough in, uh, in, of Scripture. You, you have enough solid ground in your understanding of Scripture, that you know that there are real problems when it comes to the suggestion, even the mere suggestion, that a New Testament believer in Christ today can lose his or her salvation, can wind up in hell because he committed the unpardonable uh, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Folks, if that's what you believe, you have to go against a whole lot of Scripture. And I'm talking about a ton of it. You'd have to take and throw out a lot of Scripture. Just on the surface, logically, uh, thinking logically about it, if you, if, if you have just a little understanding of the New Testament life of the believer in Christ you know that this cannot happen. So why is it there? Why did the Holy Spirit feel the need? Why did He, why did he feel the need to, 
to even record the, that narrative, that account, that historical account of such an offense, an unpardonable offense in the Word of God. How does that apply to our lives? How does that relate to us? How does that affect us? And there's nothing wrong with asking that question. There's nothing at all wrong with us looking into that, to that matter. But I think that what you're going to find out when you take a serious look at it and you do so by use of your spiritual senses by which you've been trained to discern truth from error, I think that what you're going to realize is you're going to realize rather than, than, than to be, come away held in bondage or, or infused with fear and trembling over uh, such a prospect, I think, I think you're going to find some comfort. Now, now, this is a very sensitive, delicate topic, I know. But let me try to explain this in the most simple, concise way as I know how. Now, the effectiveness of, of that deception, that false teaching, is very, is really quite easy uh, to understand. The false teachers are, are the only ones who profess to have the knowledge of what is called the Holy Ghost and what is not. Of course, the simple truth is that, and here it is, and I'm sure that that's going to raise a lot of questions in people's minds as far as the words that we're, that we're looking at, the words that were written, and what our Lord said about it. Folks, I want you to, and I have, I have tried to be an encouragement to you to take and study diligently, to look at context, to look at uh, how to go through these passages carefully. Scripture always interprets Scripture and the answer to that question as to what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not found outside that passage. In fact, it's found right within it. Right within the passage. What we come to understand is that this was a sin against the Spirit of God when He was manifest through the Son of God as instructed by God the Father. Mark chapter 3, verse 30 makes it absolutely crystal clear that it was because they, that is the scribes, were saying that He, Jesus in the flesh, not Jesus in us, has an unclean spirit. Okay? So they were saying that the miracle requested by the perfect will of God the Father, done by God the Holy Spirit, through God the Son, was done by demonic forces. And that cannot be duplicated today. Jesus would have to be here in the flesh for it to be duplicated today. Jesus Christ, folks, would have to be here in the flesh performing miracles by the Holy Spirit of God for that to be duplicated today. Now that's the truth of it. That's the truth of the, of the matter. Because they were saying, He, Christ, has an unclean spirit. Now, I'm sure that there'll be some questions uh, regarding, uh, well, but Steve, what about, it says that it'll, be, it'll never be forgiven, not in this age or in the age to come. See, that means that we can do that today. No, that, that's not what that means. What the text is saying is, is that for those who did that then, when Jesus, who stood in front of Jesus and accused the work that the Father was doing through Him to Satan, that if they were to do that, it would not be forgiven, not then, 
nor ever would it be forgiven. That's what the text is saying. If you've followed this ministry for any length of time, you know that we I actually touch on and, and try my best to address uh, a, a whole lot of error that's, that per, it seems to permeate uh, modern evangelicalism today. The only way to be released from the bondage of false teaching, which is what we should all desire, and is not only for ourselves, but we should want that in the lives of others. To the life of Christ is to search out the truth and abandon all fiction that the Holy Spirit exposes and grants the grace to abandon. Many... Uh, Many untrue sayings. That's, this is just one, one aspect of false teaching. Many untrue sayings have been attributed to Scripture, and many Christians believe them to be inspired truth. Sayings like, God helps those who help themselves. I, I have an uncle who actually believes that. And a great number of Christians and non-Christians who call themselves Christians believe that to be a text from the Bible and they actually live their lives accordingly. And, you know, it's no wonder that uh, why, you know, it's no wonder why they believe Scripture contradicts itself when they receive such garbage as truth. Because actually just the opposite is, tr is true. God will have nothing to do with the deeds of the flesh. We know that from Galatians chapter 5, Romans chapter 7 and 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now I've touched on this one before, and this is, I know this falls on very sensitive ears. It's a sacred cow, but I'll, at the risk of, of just, you know, and I, like I said, I've mentioned it before, and that hasn't brought our viewers down to like, you know, 10 views a video so I'll I'll be I'll be brave enough to to mention this again I would mention this folks if it cost me every single subscriber that I have every single viewer I have and I had to close this channel down I'm going to tell you this another one of these untrue sayings is that obedience brings blessings now you're free to leave I'll let me pause right here and give you a chance to now why would I say that oh Steve obedience brings blessings are you kidding me no I'm not kidding folks this saying is nearly universal in the church today this one seemingly harmless saying actually what it does is it, it invalidates the finished work of Christ. The Hebrew believers under the law, they could say that with confidence. Just read Deuteronomy chapter 28. But that is not true for those of us in Christ today. Romans chapter 10. The lie that obedience brings blessings is to say that God only blesses when performance is accomplished in accordance with a standard that is law that is to say that we live under the under law not grace to say obedience brings blessings is to suggest we live under law not grace in in fact folks it's the a absolute opposite and i know this is a tough pill to swallow but satan has taken god's word and reversed it it's not that obedience brings blessings. Blessings actually brings obedience. And I hope in God, I hope to God, and I, I, I hope and I pray that, that you people will at least, 
examine the scriptures for yourselves to see if, if what I'm saying is not so. Grace says that we are blessed apart from any merit, accomplishments, obedience, or otherwise. To, to, to do any, anything else is to, to live like that under, under the idea, the principle of law, that obedience brings blessings, results in our casting off Christ's perfect righteousness in our lives and manufacturing, putting in its place our own filthy, unrighteous, filthy as rags unrighteousness. Untrue sayings. You hear a lot of them. There's a lot of them, folks. I wish that was not the case, but untrue sayings are hazardous to the believer's spiritual health. This is, this is not a light matter, folks. Christians can be walking down the wrong path and not know it. Another saying that sounds good is, is practice makes perfect. Well, we know that there's only one God who's perfect. And every time that He's manifest through a life, He's manifest as He is perfect. Only His work is perfect. The new man is sinless. The new man cannot sin. All the old man does is sin. But the new man cannot sin. We are under grace, not law. Another is, well, some Christians are too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. I've heard that ever since I was just a, a little boy. And again, this is not only non-scriptural, it's actually anti-scriptural. We are exhorted to keep our attention on the source of our life, that is Jesus Christ, not on the source of our sins. We're told to keep our eyes off of our circumstances and on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Folks, I want you to be beware of, of current trends to lump God's complex work in your life into some pat solution such as, you know, let go and let God. Name it and claim it. You know, you are what you say. You know, that, there's actually too many untrue sayings to, for me to list here in just one video. And they all do their damage. What they do is they fill the place where truth ought to be with error. They actually drive a wedge between our Savior and us. Why would we want to do anything that drove a wedge between us and Christ? Same is true with empty rituals. Rituals, folks. Okay? Our relationship with Christ is a, a real and intimate relationship. The use of synthetic rituals will always drive us farther away from the moment by moment walk and talk with Him, which is what we, we ought to all desire. I'm talking about a ritual. Any established form, structure, time, activity, or process whereby a spiritual result is expected to occur by the exercise of that activity. And, and that may include your uh, setting aside a specific uh, time for prayer or Bible study, scheduled prayer. Oh my gosh, it's you like you actually would schedule it, or fellowship time, or whatever you've devised. I mean, listen, folks. You know this as well as I do. Some churches actually have pre-printed prayers, devotionals, worship rites. You know, it's, it's stand when I say stand. You sit when I say sit. You sing when I say sing. And the rest of the time you sit there quiet.
there's been a, a many a time where that I, you know, the, the pastors asked to, you know, I've gone to a meeting where the pastor would, would or the, the worship leader even would, would want everybody to rise, you know, and I would stay sitting. I'm talking about rituals, folks. Rituals. It's a vain, empty thing. I mean, w would any of you apply the same standard to your spouse? Like, hey, honey, it's five o'clock. It's time to kiss. How do you think God feels? If your relationship is not one of personal intimacy, then just what is it? I want you to know that rituals maintain an unrealistic distance between you and God. And then when new ones are added to the collection, they continue to increase the distance between you and God. Anytime a formula is given to you to perform step by step, you've been handed a new ritual. And rituals, folks, are death to any, any relationship. Any relationship. Something else just as harmful is uh, there, there are, are Christian cliches, and man, there is a ton of those. They're essentially true, but they're, they're oversimplified. I'm talking about cliches like you need to turn your life over to Christ or go with God and hundreds of others. Really, they just hurt the ears rather than help the hearts of the listeners. Now, that's a little more complex, in-depth, you know, uh, study. But, folks, there's, there should never, we should shun any idea, any thought of, of there ever coming in between us and our, our, our lovely Savior, our relationship with Him, anything that is artificial, You know, I, I can go around, I can run around telling, telling people all kinds of things that are basically true. They're, they're, they're these trite cliche, uh, Christian so-called, you know, uh, cliches, and they're worn out cliches. And while they might be true, they fail to incorporate the essentials needed to accomplish the realities that, that they espouse. They, they all require more revelation from God, illumination from the Holy Spirit. And, and, and faith, supernatural faith, to trust God concerning the truths that they, that they present. Yet somehow we've been led to believe that the cliches on their own contain the power, the, the truth that will cause some divine change in another's life. And I think equally as tragic, other Christians claim and, and maintain their own personal bag of cliches by which they sadly attempt to live out their own lives in the Lord. These cute little sayings, folks, they can numb the believer from further study and involvement in areas that the Holy Spirit desperately desires we be involved in. Life is not a trite cliché. And neither is our living relationship with our Lord. Neither He nor His work within us is static, and, and neither should be our view towards Him. Everything that we incorporate into our lives, just like every all the anything that we all the anything that we eat, folks, anything that we put inside our body is going to affect our body. In the same sense. In the exact same sense, everything that we adopt, everything that we incorporate into our lives will either facilitate the building up or the tearing down of our walk in Him. Everything that, that we approve for our acceptance and practice ought to have the end goal of constantly bringing us into a more genuine and living relationship. Intimate. Moment by moment. Intimate 
walk with our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And these areas of myth, legend, fable, untrue, sayings, lies, these areas are held onto and they're utilized by self. The Holy Spirit won't have anything to do with them. You know, a strange thing happens, you know, usually in the life of the, of the new believer in Christ. It's like precious little time passes from when that, that, that person was a lost sinner on his knees declaring his total bankruptcy of righteousness, his own uh, uh, bankruptcy of, of worth and ability until he is storming the throne of heaven asking God what he can do for God. That's amazing. That is amazing. Just shortly before, he had nothing to offer God. And now, all of a sudden, and I want you to think about why, now he assumes that his nothingness is the fulfillment of God's need. That, that, is, that's, that is amazing. How did he get to that point? How did he get there? The truth is that service is the life of Jesus flowing out of us to others. His life through us serves others rather than our lives serving others for Him. We got that way because of we allowed ourselves to be bamboozled, folks. Do you know how many Christians there are who live their lives, who base their lives, their entire relationship, trust their entire relationship with, with God on, on what everybody else is believing, what everybody else says is true. Our service has to come out of our new nature whereby He performs the righteous service. All we can present anyone is the manifestation of the old, ugly, rotten self with all of its depraved intentions and methods. However, Christ, on the other hand, has everything to offer and He's fully competent to accomplish it in true righteousness. Just as in all other areas of Christian life, Service springs forth from truth. Therefore, if we haven't come into a personal understanding of truth in, in some given area, it is impossible to have Christ minister through us in that area. Well, uh, I've got a little bit of party news here. I've decided, we have decided to here at Blessed Hope Forever, to forgo our study in the Gospel of John. And um, before you get all uh, twisted in a knot over that, let, let me just give you a couple of reasons why. One is, is, is the difficulty of it. It is a tough book to study. Another is its length. I don't, I don't believe I would ever get out of John. Uh, it's, uh, it has taken a toll on me both mentally and physically, uh, but there's another reason, and that is I've received messages, emails uh, from viewers who are concerned about things that, that I'd love to address, I'd love to be able to address, that I'm not being able to, to address in a, in a wider sense, and so and there's, it could be one right there. Now, anyway, look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.